If I could get you all to stand for a moment. I know you just sat down, but everybody stand. Now I want you to do something for me. I want you to just start like walking in place, like a good bit, okay? Kind of like walk around in place. Now I want you to start jumping if you can do it. Jump, 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 jump. Okay, till I tell you to stop. Okay, stop. Okay, everybody, put your hand over your heart. Do you feel it beating? Did we rev it up enough, or do we need to jump some more? Okay. The heart beats 72 times a minute on average. So that's 103,680 times a day for the average heart. Can you guys feel it beating? The heart is a muscular organ which pumps blood through the blood vessels of the circulatory system. It provides the body with oxygen and with nutrients, and it also assists in removing our metabolic waste. And without this function of our heart beating, we die. And you can sit down. The heart's mentioned in the Bible It's mentioned in the New Living Translation over 830 times. Depending on translations, you can give or take a few. It's mentioned in the Bible because it's very important. But when it's talking in the Bible, it's not talking about our physical heart that we just worked up. Instead, it's talking about our inner core. It's talking about our character what makes us up inside. It's talking about our personal feelings and our desires. The wisest man to ever live. Who was that? King Solomon. He warned us in Proverbs. He said, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Well, what's it mean to guard your heart? It's much the same as what we would guard a city when we have guards around it and we're keeping it safe, we're protecting it. So when we guard our heart, we're talking about protecting it from things that could defile it, things that could come in and wreck it or ruin it or you know, make it impure and clean. And it's important because whatever goes into our heart, whatever's in our heart affects our quality of life and it affects the path that we take. The Bible says, for it determines the course of your life, and everything you do flows from your heart. And this means that when your heart is diseased, everything that comes from you is going to be unhealthy. When your heart's bitter, your life is grievous. When your heart is deceitful, you're going to live a life of deceit. And when your heart is unclean, impurity is what will be the result. So we're told in the word of God that the heart is the most deceitful of all things and desperately wicked, and the Lord is the searcher of our heart. Turn with me, if you will, to Proverbs chapter 4, starting at verse 23. It says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk. Stay away from corrupt speech. Look straight ahead and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet and stay on the safe path. Don't get sidetracked. Keep your feet from following evil. There's risk factors in heart disease. Does anybody know what they are? In physical heart disease. (laughs) They're hypertension. Obesity, Austin, help me out, diabetes, smoking, and lack of exercise are the risk factors for physical heart disease. And just like there's risk factors for physical heart disease, there is risk factors for spiritual heart disease. And the number one main risk factor for spiritual heart disease is simply following Jesus. Because when you decide to follow Jesus, you become a great big threat to the enemy. And he puts a target on your heart. Now, don't laugh, but it's a teeny tiny target, but it's over your heart, right? So he puts this target on your heart. I'm going to sit it there. And what does he do with that? What do we do when we have a target? 
I asked Austin for an arrow, and he took the, I think he put the safe tip on for me, right? He took that big metal tip off that would have cut my finger. Um, but I borrowed one of his arrows, because what the devil does is he shoots arrows at your heart. And it's arrows of all kinds of things, arrows of pride, arrows of jealousy, envy, lust, anger, bitterness, frustration. You name it. He has all kinds of arrows, many more than what I mentioned. But when these pierce our heart, and they actually lodge there, they cause disease, and they affect your course of your life. So we're going to go over a couple of the diseases they cause. Number one, they cause a hard heart. Have you ever met someone with a hard heart? I have. The Bible says, for the hearts of these people are hardened, so their eyes cannot see and their ears cannot hear. And their heart cannot understand, and they cannot turn to me and be healed. A hard heart can come from a lot of different things. One can be past abuse. You know, you, you get hurt, and you say, well, I'm not going to let them hurt me ever again. Have you ever heard somebody say that? Well, I did that for them, and I will never be a fool again. I am never going to let somebody hurt me again. And they close off their heart, and they shut people out. It can come from disappointments. You can be disappointed in people. Again, you can do and do and do for someone in their time of need. And when you need something, they're not there. And then you say, okay, I'm done. They will not hurt me again. It can be disappointments in God. Have you ever met someone and you, they prayed, and maybe it's you. You prayed and you believed, and you prayed and you believed over and over. And you knew the word of God and you used it. And your answer just didn't come yet. It just didn't happen yet. And it can cause a hard heart. A hard heart can come from anger and resentment and jealousy. The biggest one in the Bible I can think of is Cain and Abel. Cain became consumed with jealousy and anger because Abel's sacrifice was pleasing to God and his wasn't. And what did it cause in in Cain? It caused hatred for his brother, self-pity for himself. They were huge arrows that pierced his heart, led to the first murder in the Bible. Ecclesiastic 7.9 says, Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Have you ever experienced someone that was jealous of you? I have. I think we all probably have. It seemed like the minute I married my husband, who's a physician, people had this idea that my life was all of a sudden perfect, like rosy. And little did they know, you know, they didn't know much about me because if they would have really known about me, they would have known that for 10 years I was so sick I didn't hardly know what day of the week it was. So, you know, I kind of had this hurt inside of me because people were jealous and there were issues that came up with it and I I just had, you know, it was kind of all tied up. Couldn't really function right. And one day God had this really creative way, and I won't share it all with you, but he had this really creative way of showing me that their jealousy was actually between them and God. And he just released me, just like that. And now that doesn't bother me anymore. So you can be free of that. Now it's easy to spot jealousy when it's directed at you. You kids probably have that in school. It's easy to spot jealousy when it's directed at you. But what about when it's in us? It's a little bit harder for us to see. Jealousy creeps up on us, and it happens quickly. If we're not on guard... It's estimated that 25% of adults, I don't know what it is for young people, but 25% of adults who use social media actually report envy, jealousy, and inferiority after they look at people's social media posts. That's right. And it happens quick. 
because you know what it's like? You have a bad day, and you're like, I'm just going to relax, so I'm going to kick back on the couch. I'm going to you know, put the recliner out. I'm going to scroll social media a little bit. And before long, you see that so-and-so, they went on a vacation to Hawaii, and you're home working every day, busting your butt to pay the bills. Or you see that so-and-so's husband actually sent her this big, beautiful bouquet of flowers just because, and your anniversary came and went and you didn't get a thing. Or you see that these pictures of these families look completely perfect. And you're laying there and your kids are like ripping each other apart in the next room. They're fighting. So, you know, and before long, these little daggers are just, these little arrows are just coming at you and they're like, ugh. And jealousy starts to set in. And you can have a big problem if you don't deal with it. A hardened heart cannot love properly. And that is the most important commandment from God. He said, love one another as I have loved you. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples. See, we have to care more about other people than what we do about ourselves. The word of God says, when you see someone in need, do not harden your heart to them, but open wide your hand and fulfill their need. Being a Christian is not about going to church on Sunday morning and a Wednesday night prayer night or a youth group, and that's it. Like, that's not what it's about. It's about fulfilling God's love every single day to our brothers and sisters around us. The Bible says if you have what it takes to meet a brother's need and you close off your heart of compassion, you shut it off because you have a hard heart. How can you say that the love of God is inside of you? When you have a hard heart, it's impossible to love others the way God calls us to. Number two is an unbelieving heart. Hebrews 3.12 says, Be careful then, dear brothers and sisters. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving turning you away from the living God. You know, Thomas had this heart condition. What did Thomas say? He said, I will not believe unless I see the nail prints in his hands and I put my finger in them and I put my hand in his side. I will not believe unless that happens. And what did God say? What did he say? He said, Thomas, you believe because you've seen but blessed are those who believe without seeing. That's us, right? We haven't seen. So unbelief can happen when you're going through a hard time and you've prayed and you've waited. You've prayed, you've waited. You've used the word of God against it. It was your weapon. It was, you know, you were going after it. You were, you were going to win this and you are still waiting. And a little bit of unbelief begins to set in. Do you know anybody that this happened to? Does it happen to yourself? A little bit of unbelief comes. You start slipping into it. And then what do you do? You know what you do? You stand up. You stand up and you say, I'm going to believe God anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. You be the kind of person that Jesus was talking about when he said, blessed are you that haven't, received, haven't seen. You haven't seen yet. And you're still blessed. You believe God anyway. You honor him by believing. You say, I'm going to keep standing. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to believe that God's good. I'm going to believe that he's for me. I'm going to believe that I will overcome by the blood of the lamb. I will overcome no matter how long it is. Have you ever met someone and they just seem to have everything come against them? I think of Mike. Just, you know, one thing after another thing, after another thing, after another thing. The battle's long and it's hard. And you keep on believing. But you know why it is so hard? Because they are a threat to the enemy. He sees them as a big, huge threat. It's because the devil's actually afraid of them. In the spiritual realm, he's afraid of what they are and what plans the Lord has for them. He's afraid, so he comes at them with everything that he has. And if that's you, if you're sitting there and you're thinking, that's me, 
then you got to remind yourself this greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. And repeat after me. Say, I serve the Lord God. He's the mountain mover. He's the way maker. He's the miracle worker. The Lord of lords. The King of kings. And I have to win because victory is his. The Bible tells us to have the faith of a child. Have you ever watched children? I love to swim at the Y. And I get a real kick out of these kids. They'll get up on the diving board of the deep end, and they'll just kind of stand there. And they'll look out like this, and they just won't jump. And their parents on the sideline over here going, go, Johnny, go. You know, jump. You can do it. You can do it. And they won't do it. They'll just stand there, and I'm out here in the water kind of watching, you know, because I want to see what happens. And they'll just... They'll just like freeze in fear. But you know what makes a difference? When that parent gets in the water. When that parent is in the water, I love to watch it. And they're kind of, you know, treading water, but they're trying to hold their hands up. And they're going, go, Johnny, go. I'm here. Johnny jumps. He just jumps right in. You know why? Because he knows that his father is in the water. And he's not going to let him drown. He's not going to let anything happen to him. He's going to take care of him. He's going to keep him safe. He's going to pull him into shore. And you too have a father who will not let you drown. One of my favorite scriptures is Isaiah 43 2. It says, when you go through deep water, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. And when you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up because the flames will not consume you. He will carry you to safety, but first you have to believe him. You have to believe he's able. You have to believe he's willing. And believe that he'll make a way in the wilderness and he'll make streams in the wasteland because that's what he does. Number three, hard heart, or number three heart condition is a presumptuous heart. Last time I spoke, were you guys, how many were here last time I spoke? I spoke about honoring others. And this is what a presumptuous heart is. It's one that dishonors. It's one that goes ahead and does things out of line, out of order. They don't have permission, but they venture out on their own anyway. They don't honor those in authority over them. They're arrogant, confident, and unreasonably bold. Remember Peter, when he walked on the water? Did he just get out of the boat and start walking? You know what he said? He said, Father, bid me come. Bid me come to you. And Jesus said, come. He was asking permission. He was saying, can I do it? Is it okay with you? Will you be with me? He knew that he needed God. He couldn't do it on his own. So we can't operate out of dishonor for others. Number three is a hypocritical, judgmental heart. Matthew 7, 2 says, For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. A judgmental heart is a heart that hears the message of love and mercy and forgiveness, but they don't extend that same message to someone else. They don't extend that love and mercy and forgiveness to others. There's a parable that Jesus tells in Matthew chapter 18 about the unforgiving debtor. So it's about a king, and he wants to bring his accounts up to date. So he calls in his his debtor who owed him millions of dollars, and he says, you have to pay me. And the debtor says, I don't have the money. And he kneels down and he says, please have mercy on me. Give me more time. Have mercy on me. And the king had compassion. And he said, okay, your debt is cleared. Your debt's gone. And that same man gets up, goes out and finds another man who owed him less than what he was forgiven. And he grabbed him by the neck and he said, pay me. 
And the man said, have mercy on me. Give me more time. Have mercy on me, please. And he wouldn't. He had him thrown into prison till the debt could be paid. And when the king got word of it, he became angry. And he called the man in and he said, you evil, evil, evil servant. He said, I forgave you a tremendous debt. Shouldn't you extend, extend that same mercy to others? And the king had him thrown into prison, tortured. And Jesus said, this is what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Forgiveness. Unforgiveness is one of the arrows. Number five is pride. Proverbs 16, 18 said that pride goes before destruction and haughtiness or the appearance of being superior before a fall. Remember the story of Jonah? You know, we all remember about the fish and, you know, him being in the whale of a belly or belly of a whale. But we don't really think much about what happened to him afterwards. The Bible doesn't tell us anything that happened to him afterwards. So the story goes that the Lord told him to go to Nineveh. And he wanted him to give a message to the Ninevites. And Jonah didn't want to. So he ran on to Tarshish. I can barely say that. Tarshish. Hopped on a boat, was going, and what happens? But this violent storm comes, a violent storm, and the sailors are working really hard to try to, you know, keep the water from making the boat drown, and they said, what is causing this storm? And they cast lots, and they they said, it's Jonah, and Jonah knew it was him. He was down hiding underneath a stern, and he said, just throw me overboard, and it'll, it'll get calm. It's me. I'm running from God. And they didn't want to. The Bible says they did not want to throw him overboard. I mean, who would want to do that? So they kept working harder, but it wasn't working. They were all going to drown. So they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us for what we're going to do to this man. And they threw Jonah overboard. But the Lord has mercy on Jonah. And he brings a big whale to swallow Jonah. And yes, I believe this. Some people say, they don't believe in that story. I believe in all of this. All of the Bible. So he brought a big whale, and he swallowed Jonah. And three days later, he spit Jonah out on shore, and God gave him another chance to go to Nineveh. And this time he went. Would you go after all that? This time he went. And he told the Ninevites that in 40 days they were going to be overthrown because of their rebellion against God. And what happened in Nineveh? But the people believed him. And they got on their knees and they prayed. And they asked forgiveness and they fasted. And they wept. And even the king did it. The whole city repented. And our Lord God had mercy And he did not bring the destruction. And what's the Bible say Jonah did? Jonah became angry. Angry. Because what he told the Ninevites is not what was going to happen. And he went so far as to say, just kill me now, Lord. If what I said to the Ninevites is not going to come true, I'd rather just be dead. Just kill me now. You see, Jonah was more concerned with what the people thought of him than what he was with those people. Jonah had a pride issue, and the Bible never mentions him again. When what we do is simply for ourselves or to make ourselves look good or to puff ourselves up, we are in a very dangerous place. Symptoms of pride or defensiveness, harshness, desperate for attention, neglecting others, and finding fault. And Ephesians 4.2 says, be completely humble and be gentle and be patient and bear with one another in love. So these are just five of the main ones. But he throws all kinds of arrows at us. 
So what do we do when we find these things are inside of us? Or how do we guard our heart against them even coming at us in the first place? King Solomon, who gave us the advice to begin with, actually had his heart lured away in his old age by the women that he married. They were from other countries. He started to worship their gods instead of the one true Jehovah God that his father David worshipped. Now, Proverbs is a really neat book because I used to not like it. I, used, I actually used to get annoyed at Proverbs because it would just be these couple little lines of nuggets and you'd have to think about it all day long. Now that I've gotten older, I actually like it. I actually like those little lines of wisdom. So they usually are just these little lines of wisdom and they kind of go together in these little sections and you just ponder them all day long. You just think on them. But I believe this particular section in chapter 4 goes together. And I believe the answer to how we guard our hearts actually lies right before the warning. So if you turn to verse 20 in Proverbs chapter 4, this is the answer. It says, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. This is referring to the word of God. This is his words. You know, I did a survey a couple weeks ago. I asked 10 really simple questions on social media, put it out there, got over 150 responses. I made sure that I put it on, you know, my Facebook page, which has a lot of Christian friends, but I also made sure I put it on some other ones that I knew wasn't Christian, because I wanted to just get a nice variety of people. Some of the conclusions were that 61% of the people that I surveyed actually attended church three or more times per month. It was pretty good. Of those who attended church, 82% believe that the Word of God is alive and powerful and has the ability to change things. 51% read their Bible just one to two times a week. And 27% don't take the time to read it at all. And the bottom of my questions had a couple little foundational truths. And I found that because they weren't reading the Bible, they actually missed out on some of the foundational truths. So what we have is 78% of people who don't take time to read the Word of God. And yet we had early Christians that died for it. They believed in it so much that they gave up their life for it. We have Bibles laying in our houses getting dusty, We have Bible apps on our phone, and yet we don't take the time to read the Word of God, not like we should. And yet the Scripture says, listen carefully to my words. That means reading the Word of God and listening to what it speaks inside of your spirit. Because after we read it, and then we get alone with God, and we ask Him what it means, He speaks it into our heart. He speaks it into our spirit, and we know what the meaning was says, don't lose sight of my words. Let them penetrate deep into your heart, for they bring life to those who find them, and they bring healing to their whole body. So we guard our heart with the word of God. The word of God produces faith, and faith forms the shield to block the enemy. Now, don't laugh. I have a little kid's shield. It's big enough to protect your heart, though, right? My kids said you'd all get a good laugh out of it, because it's I see Jesse laughing because it's kind of small, you know. I think I'll give it to a kid then. (laughs) But anyway, it, it forms a shield. Proverbs 2 says, My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. For the Lord your God is your son and he is your shield. The Bible is the shield against the enemy. Jesus used the word of God against the enemy three times in the desert when he was fasting. And we are to use it too. But we can't use it when we're not in it. We have to be in it. So then when Satan says to you, oh, you're never going to make it, you'll never make it. You can say, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When he says, look at the vacation that your friends just took, you can say, but you know what? My heavenly father has many rooms. He has many rooms. And I'm a citizen of heaven, and my home outshines the sun. 
And when he says you're not loved, you can say, but my heavenly father, he loves me. And the Bible says I'm the apple of his eye. And when Satan says you're just a nobody, you can say, oh, no, no. I'm a daughter of the king. I'm a son of the king. And I am, my God is not moved by this world. My God is not moved by this world. He is with me and he goes before me. And because he goes before me, I will not fear. Now, the Bible says that without vision, the people perish. So what do you see in your future? You have to see it in your heart before you can see it in your dreams. So we put the Word of God in our heart, and it eventually controls our mind, which affects our thoughts, it affects our dreams, it affects our vision for the future. Last week, Ted spoke on vision. But we can't have vision if we have heart disease in us. Because it won't take place yet. It won't be clear. My parents, they're not here today, so I can tell this story. They love to watch the news. I mean, they love to watch the news. And so they'll call me and they'll say, you know, did you see what happened out in California? And sometimes I've, you know, read about it on my phone or something, but I said, well, not really, you know, what happened? And they'll start to tell me, or sometimes I have seen it, but I really don't know all the ins and outs of all of it. I know enough to know what's going on in the world. But I don't want what's in the news to pierce my heart. Because I used to watch it and get fearful. We have to guard our heart. So I've chosen not to let it in. Instead, I want the word in there. Yes, I see the news. Yes, I see what's happening all around us. But I'm choosing to protect my heart. And maybe some of you have to do that. I'm not telling you not to be informed. But guard your heart against fear, against discouragement. I choose not to get discouraged. I will not be hopeless. God is on the throne. He's not done with me yet. He's not done with this church. He's not done with our nation. He's not done yet. The Lord that brought, that, you know, he started the good work, and he's going to finish it. He's going to be faithful to finish it. It's not done, and it's not over. And if I keep letting my mind go back into that kind of stuff, pretty soon I'm going to walk in defeat. I'm going to walk in discouragement. So to me, it's about, am I going to believe the Bible, or am I going to believe the news? Am I going to believe the reporter that's given it, or am I going to believe the men who were inspired by God to write the word? I'm not going to allow the enemy's arrows to pierce my heart with doubt and unbelief and fear. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So how are you thinking? Are you thinking that it's over? Are you thinking I'm done? This is the end. That's a lie from the enemy. You know, I I know a lady whose sister's battling cancer. It's a very severe form of cancer. And the other day on Facebook, she wrote on that a bird flew into her window. And and it died. And she said, I hate to think what that means. I guess she's talking about some old wives' tale that somebody in the family's going to die. Does anybody know? I think that's what she's talking about. And I thought, oh, my goodness gracious. So I I got on and I said to her, I said, you know, don't believe the lie of the enemy. Like He wants you to believe that right now. I said, all it means is your windows are clean. So the bird couldn't see. You know, I said, don't believe that. So, you know, we we cannot believe the lies of the enemy. We can't do that. We have to allow the word into our heart, the enemy out. Once it affects our mind... It then comes out of our mouth. Jesus said, whatever's in your heart will determine what you say. Remember when Jesus spoke to the fig tree in Mark chapter 11? He was hungry. Jesus got hungry. He was hungry, and he was walking by the fig tree. And the poor fig tree, it wasn't even time to produce figs yet. I always felt bad for the tree. And Jesus said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the next day, the disciples are walking by, and they say, you know, 
Master, Master, look, the, the tree, it's all withered up. It's gone. It's, it's dead. And Jesus said, have faith in God. He said, I tell you the truth that you can say to this mountain, may, may you be lifted up and may you be thrown into the sea. And it will happen. But you must really believe that it will happen and have no doubt in your heart. I tell you, you can pray for anything. And if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. There is power in our words. So your heart will tell your mind, and your mind will tell your mouth, and you will speak out faith-filled words that deflect the enemy's arrows before they can even touch your heart. And you'll look straight ahead, and you'll fix your eyes on the author and the perfecter of your faith. You'll walk that straight and narrow path. Trusting the Lord with all your heart, leaning not on your own understanding, but acknowledging him in all your ways, and he will guide you. The Bible says, though a righteous man may fall, seven times he'll rise again. Not only does Jesus stop the arrows, but also he gets in front of you, and he protects you. He becomes your defender and your greatest shield. So why is this important for the church today? Why is this important? Because we have work to do while there's still time. I recently saw the movie Harriet. Has anybody seen that? I loved that movie. So I saw the movie Harriet. Harriet's about Harriet Tubman. She was active in rescuing the African-American slaves out of the hands of slavery, and she worked with the Underground Railroad. Highly recommend it. At the end of the movie, at the end of the movie, there's a song that plays with the credits, and I, I, I get into the song. I love the song. Um, so at the end, Brady laughed at me because at the end, everybody walked out, and me and this African-American lady are in there singing and just praising Jesus. It was just the best song. I loved it, and, 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 and uh, we liked each other. I really liked her. But anyway, the song goes like this. It says, I'm going to stand up. And I'm going to take my people with me. Together we are going to a brand new home. Far across the river, can you hear freedom calling? Calling me to answer. I'm going to keep on keeping on. And just a little side note to that movie. Her nickname was Moses. I think she's like my new hero. I love that. But anyway, the fact is that many people are slaves to Satan, and they don't even realize it. And we have Jesus. We have what they need to be free from the bondages of sin and crossing the river someday to their heavenly home. But we need to be rid of anything, anything in our heart that is causing problems so that we can do his work, so that we can do what he's asking so that we have vision and dreams. The truth is, this was a hard, hard sermon for me to speak. Before I could present it to you guys, I spent time down here at the altar this week. Because I believe there's hard issues in all of us that need dealt with. And I'm gonna open the altar for you today See, I believe that God has great and mighty plans for this church. I believe we're going to see the day that every seat is filled in here and to where we need another service. And he has plans for each of you individually. But when the arrows of the enemy, they pierce us, the disease forms. We just can't do it. So it's time for a detox. Today is about doing a detox. A detox of your heart. David said in Psalm 139, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. So I'm going to ask for every head to be bowed and every eye closed right now. I just want you to take a moment and allow God to know your heart. 
and allow him to point out anything that offends him. You know, maybe you flat out walked away from God for whatever reason. Or maybe when you look at your relationship today, it's not as close with Jesus as it was a year ago. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to get right with God. And if that's you, I'll ask you to come forward and I'll pray with you. Or maybe you're here today and you're saying, you know what, the enemy, he's taken some arrows out and he's, he's shot them at my family. He's shot them at my marriage, at my health, at my dreams and at my future. Maybe you're struggling today with discouragement or fear. Maybe you're struggling with a hard heart or unbelief, rebellion. Or maybe there's unforgiveness or pride in your life. The arrows have pierced and they're festering. And if that's you, I want you to say, today I want you to say, enough's enough. That's it. I'm pulling the arrows out and I'm allowing healing to take place. Ask forgiveness. Choose to put the word of God in your heart. Allow it to renew your mind and speak forth the promises of God. So if you need prayer today, won't you come forward?